Thank you everyone for coming back. So the idea for this session is to have a discussion. I know we were doing it in the coffee break, but the idea for this is... <laughs> no, I know. So the, the, the idea really is to stimulate the conversation, right? This is why we had the coffee break longer. Um, but this session, we're going to invite CCAC, we're going to invite um, ISWA, the International Solid Waste Association, uh, Gisela from C40, that's representing the low organic waste methane, and the World Bank to just give a couple minutes on their impressions of what we can do moving forward. COP29 is coming up, and then one year from now, the GMI Biogas Subcommittee, we're hoping to meet with, um, co-collaborate with CCAC in Brazil at their annual meeting, which is going to be in the beginning, as well as World Biogas Association, hopefully, in um, 2025. And a year from now is very soon. It happens really quickly. So the, the question I have for this group and some, not panelists, but for the people who are representing these organizations is, what does success look like? What does it look like within a year? In a year, what are we going to say that we have done? Hopefully, this group of people will see each other in Brazil in 2025. But we can, I would love to ask the question to everyone here, in a year's time, what can we say is successful? What what does it look like? What What is it we're doing that you can say we've lowered methane mitigation or methane emissions, waste emissions, uh, wastewater? Again, what what is that? So I'm going to actually hand it over to Donovan, my colleague Donovan Story from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition to just give a couple minutes and then I'll hand it over to others. Um, but please. Thanks, Monica. And first of all, congratulations on a on a great uh, session. Uh, the biogas session over the last few days it's been fantastic <clears throat> a lot of great uh, a lot of great speakers and discussions so Monica just asked me to reflect on some of the things that I've uh, heard and then I think some others are going to to do so as well and I th I think that, that there's a there's an old uh, saying of which the the provenance is not quite known but it is may you live in interesting times which is often used as a curse, but I think is also somewhat of an opportunity. And I think it's it's something which sort of struck me through the the whole um, this whole biogas session over the last few days, and generally at at the GMF is that we do live in very very interesting times, uh, and that provides us, I think, uh, and we've we've heard a lot of people talking, a lot of experts. And just reflecting on CC, CCAC's own work and direction as well, that we're clearly at, a, I think, an agreed turning point. Uh, and I'm going to, I think, state what everyone's kind of heard and in, in, in different ways over the last few few days. But clearly, I think there's an there's an agreement that business as usual is uh, even for over the next decade is not possible, and it won't result in a livable future. So we are really at a critical junction in terms of waste in particular, um, where I work, uh, where tinkering at the sides, slightly improving tipping fees, uh, working on you know slightly increased charging for uh, collection of delivery from commercial operators, these sorts of things around the edges that we've talked about over the last couple of decades are clearly not working at the scale and at the speed that's required. So we do need, and I think we have heard this as well, quite, I think, radical ideas and thinking outside of outside of the square. And I think I discussed with Carlos as well from, from Eastware on this the other day, that we have to move away from incrementalism and towards a, a revolution of the way that we see waste. The, the data is there. We've seen that in plenary and in the session, the volumes of waste that we can expect. It can, is no surprise. It's there, right? We can anticipate these volumes. We know that they're coming. We can anticipate what their consequences will be. We can see the finance and data gap, gaps, and we can see those graphs. And there's there should be nothing surprising there in terms of what can be expected unless we change uh, direction quite rapidly. And simply put, we just have 
we 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 continue to to approach waste with with 21st century problems and 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 com- consequences with 19th century waste solutions we still fundamentally collect and dump waste and even in the context of that we only collect and dump around half of waste the rest of it we just dump or burn and I mean, that's where we're at in waste. If we're really, really honest about it, at, the, at, a, at, a, at a global level, we're at a very sort of basic to intermediate level of sophistication in dealing with waste. And we're really seeing the consequences of that. And I think that bringing waste out of just a waste discussion into a climate discussion that's occurred over the last several years is helping us, I think, more critically reflect on what needs to be done because no longer are these just local problems no longer do we just look at slides from from cape town or we look at slides from bangkok and say well that's terrible people there must be really horrified with their waste management issues it has a global consequence what happens there and what happens at a global level everywhere and we heard dominic talk about the uk as well has consequences for us all so it's become a a global uh, issue waste. And I think that that provides us with the curse an opportunity because it allows us to start to speak in different languages and to connect with different kinds of expertise. I think one of the things that CCAC tries to, to do then really is engaging with almost 90 state uh, parties and, and almost the same number of uh, non-state uh, partners as well is is learn from both state-driven systems and non-state actors what some of these innovations are. And I think that uh, they have been, they are really important to be able to not only learn from, but to respond to. I think though that it's very, very important that, and I think this came through in the last session, is that we also recognize not just official non-state actors or state actors, but the voices of those that actually work in waste management systems. And in the majority of countries, they're not rep- their voice is not represented necessarily at GMF, no, no criticism of GMF at all, but that is the waste pickers, the cooperatives, the people that collect waste, the people that make decisions on a daily basis on, the, on, on, on price issues, on their recognition of citizens, of uh, the, the small resources that they have. And I think in the last session, we really start to talk about environmental justice and just transitions and giving greater voice to those communities as well. So if I could just finish on three things, and it's a really boring topology, but maybe think about them in different ways. So thinking about finance data and policy, which we've been talking about over the last few days, I think that there's a recognition and it's come through particularly today. There is a lot spent on waste systems globally, a lot of money, and it's not working. So the money that's been spent is not going in the right directions. We had a discussion about revenue streams being kind of the poor brother of discussing uh, finance systems. Um, and the and the money that's been spent on waste management is not benefiting at all um, in terms of actions. You know, what has it been spent on? Who is benefiting from the investments in waste? And do we need to rethink finance which is, becomes much more transformational. I think with data as well, there's a parable about uh, a man late at night looking under a light, and he's, he's searching really, really carefully under the light. And someone comes past and says, why, wh- why are you looking under this light? And he goes, I've lost my car keys. He says, Did you drop your car keys here? And he goes, no, but this is where the light is. So it's much easier. And I think that's the same with data. We can, I think we've had a transformation of data discussions over the last few years. And I think it's really useful, but data has to be relevant. It has to be owned. It has to be linked to actions. And it's really exciting to see satellite data and large scale data, but it must shed light uh, for those who are trying to make a difference on the ground. And I think it's really important that we connect data with people and actions. And I think that that's something that's come through over the last couple of days. And the final thing is policy. I think that we need to understand that there are a number of policies in place in countries. Sometimes there are very good policies in place uh, that we can leverage and work from as a community and not ignore 
or reinvent or or come in and as as was pointed out in the last session, just overlay with consultancies another set of policies or guidelines. So there's a lot to be learnt from the policies that are there, why they're not working, what are some of the impediments in terms of regulatory frameworks and waste management. I think with CCAC, just a final word is that, you know, we really welcome uh, engagement with this community on coming up with these innovative solutions of driving new ideas, of thinking outside the box, of connecting state and non-state actors, uh, but with a focus, I think, too, on just transitions uh, and environmental justice. I think that also there's an opportunity, as I was saying, to, to rethink finance, to ensure that finance uh, leads to sustainable uh, revenue streams and sustainable solutions over time. And finally, I think that we, as an organisation, really understand the importance of supporting uh, responsible state actions. And I think it's a it's a really pivotal piv pivotal time, actually, with the end of the old Kyoto MRV systems of uh, climate reporting towards the enhanced transparency framework and the changes that will bring in terms of transparency and accountability of the data that we were talking about this morning and the engagement of non-state actors in that process provides also another great leverage point um, to connect state uh, responsible state actors with non-state actors on emissions reporting and on the changes that need to result from that. So that was just a bit of a summary from today, but also from the last few days as well. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to invite Stefania, if that's okay, just to her perspective from the World Bank, just to, for the future discussion. And then have Carlos from ISWA, and then what we're going to do is to stimulate more kind of an open discussion, because I think it would be great for the people in this room if we can have just a conversation. I know there's quite a lot of people in here, but it'd be really nice to have an open dialogue without having to throw the mic around. So we're going to have five, five minutes from both speakers. And then um, unfortunately for the online folks, we're going to say thank you and then close the online so we don't have to talk with a microphone and we can hopefully have more of a conversation if that is okay with everyone here. So I'm going to give the microphone to Stefania. Good, so we can be more informal, right? I don't need to be sitting there teaching, no? <laughs> the teaching model. <laughs> okay, um, l l let me just say what we have done in the last, since July last year, when Ajay Banga, our new president came, first no American president, we absolutely love him. First thing he did was to change the mission of the World Bank, and now the mission is to end poverty on a livable planet. And that's absolutely critical because the livable planet is all about climate and a lot of the climate is methane. And this is historical for us that we have on a livable planet, which means that it's not only um, um, providing, uh, supporting a development that get people, you know, to have a decent life, but that a decent life, which means in a, it has a clean air, clean water, and all these basics. So this is huge, is among us. Um, at COP, uh, seven months later, at COP um, 28, he um, also announced that the bank is, we are going to do 50% of all our commitments, all our investments are going to be climate or Paris aligned. And this is huge. 50 because not everything sometimes we do education with the curriculum for schools you can't be 100 percent i hope you understand it's not that we are trying just to you know hide and do some roads yes some roads not so everything so but this means that since july last year 100 percent of the portfolio that is tagged to be aligned is being scrutinized in terms of GAG emissions and in terms of Paris alignment. So I was today in a call with someone who has an agriculture $250 million project, agriculture one in, in, in Egypt, that has not been aligned. And because of that, we are not letting them, the team, to move forward to the next step of project preparation. So, but this is huge as well. The other thing, the beauty that he did is he announced the methane. He bought totally the 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 methane, he understands the urgency and the need for that. And at COP, he, um, he launched 
our global methane reduction blueprint. And our blueprint has what we call the triple wins approach. So in which we are talking about the mitigation that everybody wants, the near term reduction. But we are talking about other two things which are really what excite our clients and get the action to happen, which is to enhance the resilience environment. We are talking about the environmental here and we are talking about and also empower livelihoods. So when we talk to our clients, right, we don't go there and say, hey, Ministry of you know, India, we need to reduce your methane. You're going to laugh at us. We say we need to we need jobs. Right. We need production systems. We need da, 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 da. let's talk about growth, but let's do it right. Right. It's high time for us to do it right. And it's been amazing. So that's our triple is our blueprint to implement the blueprint. He launched two platforms which call partnership platforms. One is being led by our energy team working on oil and gas, methane in oil and gas. They have a lot of money and that's one aspiration I have for the next year. And I ask everybody help. We need to advocate for methane outside oil and gas. These guys, they have so much money. <laughs> they are so rich and they, have, they can do the plumbing. They can do it. I can assure you they can do it, right? They can do plumbing and fix their valves. Exactly. So that's way sanitation. I have, and okay, the second platform that I have to coordinate, I love it, which is under the climate change group where I sit at the bank, the corporate level. We are about 140 people trying to get the machine to be climate aligned. Well, it's fun. 15,000 we have to get moving. Um, I have to coordinate livestock, rice, waste, and sanitation. These four sectors, I have to coordinate the entire institution. Yeah. And I have like a fraction of funds of what my colleagues in energy. So this is an aspiration. We need to shout, right? We need to really say, we are talking about three absolutely basic systems of life, food systems, energy system, water systems which we are destroying, if not destroying and depleted quite severely by a fourth system we have created, which is the pollution system. Right? So that's how I talk to the president and everybody who got to do. So we, I, that's my aspiration. That's in this COP now. We can really make a case for these other sectors, and we can. We just, I don't know what, we don't. So we need to start shouting. I'm shouting from within the bank. You can be sure about that. But we need to keep shouting from, and these and others are doing. But anyway, so he launched the two platforms. So what we are doing is we are mainstreaming our integrating methane, specifically our methane. Uh, uh, we are, so that, what I want to say is we are not doing only one. We are doing all methane. We are doing everything. All the 60% of the anthropogenic uh, emissions, we the, the environmental team take care of wetlands. This is a whole world in itself. But on the human sides, we are addressing it 100%, um, let me say, uh, from that. Now, Ajay being Ajay, he said, but having a blueprint platforms and is not enough. So he also announced that we are going to launch by... July next year, 15, what we call 15 country led programs. And these are flagship operations that we are going, we already done methane abatement in the sectors and we are going to scale. So that's another thing. So one is the story. The second one is the scale. We know we have done collectively here. We have done thousands of it, small here, small here, and there, everybody doing separate. It's time to put this together, scale, bold, faster. That's are the three things we want, is really to create this, do it. Safe. We have already selected that. We have, I have a map outside energy with the colleagues. We map 66 operations with in the bank under preparation, the majority of them, which is if we get the methane there, we are going to um, 
deploy, put out there 12 billion dollars of investments in the sectors, including waste. Waste is about 1.2 billion. Um, the majority is agriculture is really big, but sanitation we are there. But anyway, we are going to be able to mobilize about 12 billion dollars this fiscal year. Next fiscal year, hopefully 10 more. And if you help me to make us know and get the money we need to get things done, because the governments, they don't borrow for that. You say World well, Bank has all the money. We don't. We are we manage the money that is trusting us. The money is the governments. And they, you know, um, they don't borrow to do MRVs and all these kind of fancy things. They want money for infrastructure. Majority, 70-80% has to be infrastructure, something for policy, a little bit on soft for jobs. We push hard that. So we need a lot of grant um, and a lot of support to get that part of story. And that's another, my fourth desire is that we can uh, have more money, grant money to get that piece done so we can mobilize billions of dollars. And I stop here. <laughs> Well, that goes nicely into thank you, Stefania, and to Carlos's comments from the International Solid Waste Association. So I'm going to hand the mic over. And then we'll have a hopefully a really heartful, fruitful discussion after this. Thank you. OK, now? OK. So thank you very, very much, Monica. It has been really, really great to be here during these days to meet with all these friends and learn a lot. And like uh, also have the chance to take some notes after Donovan's summary. Very helpful. Thank you very much, Donovan. And like uh, also uh, have a glance of what's happening on the financial sector because I'm sure that almost all of us came here looking for money, looking for funds. How can we make it happen? How can we make it happen? And uh, just to start, uh, 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 Stefania, from from your your numbers, like uh, and giving like uh, the most updated data, the waste management sector costs nowadays. $270 billion per year. $270 billion per year. So when we have $10 billion to do something, we really need to go to the next level because we won't solve the problem. We won't solve the crisis. With $270 billion per year, we still have 38% of municipal waste going to dump sites and open burning. How do we manage to do that? And I was sitting here and looking like a global methane forum, mobilizing methane action. We are bringing this climate perspective to solve one of the biggest crises that we have. But as you mentioned, Estefania, it's not only waste, like uh, this climate Finance is uh, being like a pursued by the ag sector, by the oil and gas, by uh, the steel industry, by the aviation industry. Everybody's talking about this. Uh, uh, how, how can we really mitigate methane emissions? How can we avoid and how can we abate? So those are the two questions the world is discussing, I would say, like mostly after the Global Methane Pledge, mostly after the most recent COP, when it saw uh, several uh, initiatives and coalitions uh, talking about methane. But here we are, like uh, uh, looking or like uh, on the biogas section and say, we are like a, a fraction of it. But this fraction can really solve one of the largest crises in the world. So this is the importance for us to be here and to try to, let's say, bring a reflection and see, like, 
why many other sectors have advanced, how, why many other sectors like are, are really modern. So let's say uh, uh, communications, we are like a now live stream, like people all over the world are, are watching us, like uh, in many other sectors and in the waste sector, we are still in the like 19th century. We are still having open dumps. We still didn't manage to like uh, 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 ensure a just transition and livable conditions for many people who work on that. How can we still accept that? So this is something that came to my mind after uh, uh, being here and discussing, like maybe it's because we are still having a fragmented perspective. Maybe it's because we are still talking in silos. So we come here to discuss methane. We go to another event to discuss like a, in three weeks time discussing plastics. Then we go to another one to discuss circular economy. Then we go to another one to discuss uh, waste to energy. And then we have the, uh, uh, the, the biogas uh, expo uh, uh, in July. And then so we are always discussing in silos and we at the same time, we need we all agree, as Donovan said, the business as usual is over. So one idea that discussing during these days here that I wanted to to share uh, with all of you and then open the discussion is like a why not go for a one stop shop? Why not unify our voices? Why not harmonize our views? Why not, as Stefana said, amplify and shout together in order to get some attention, in order to be visible, and in order to impact, really influence the change. So this idea that we were discussing, like uh, why not we go for kind of, let's say, global waste and resources forum, where we can all be together, where we can discuss methane, where we can discuss plastics, when we can discuss recycling, where we can discuss transboundary movement of waste, where we can discuss textiles, where we can discuss e-waste, where we can discuss just transition, equitable transition, uh, gender equality. Like, why not bring all these ingredients together and make it really big and to be uh, uh, well, let's say, perceived by those who own the power to change the world. Because if we don't go for that, we will be kept on the sidelines. We will be enjoying meetings like this because I enjoyed it a lot, but we won't change the world as it needed. It's needed to be a livable uh, world. In, for the next generation. So this would be my reflection. And I would also uh, be very, very happy to hear from you. What do you think, Like, So looking for like 2025 and beyond, why not go into a one-stop shop solution? Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. So I'm gonna think, I'm gonna thank the online community for being participating because it's gonna be d difficult to have a discussion with phone. So thank you so much. And I'm going to turn off the online portion. Thank you for participating in the Forum Biogas Subcommittee. Bye.